Hi everyone. Welcome to uh, Storybook Adventures, A Bear of a Winter. I'm Miss Maureen from the Huntington Public Library. If you are a patron of your library, I hope you have uh, been able to pick up your craft kit uh, because after a couple of stories, I'll be showing you how to make an adorable little uh, teddy bear. Um, these kits are available until the end of January, both at the main library and the station branch. And if you're not a member of the Huntington Public Library, no worries, because um, this bear is easy enough to make at home with the uh, things that you might have at home lying around. And make sure you ask your grown-up before you use anything and for help if you need it. And so let's start with our stories. Um, we're going to start with the first one. The Girl Who Lived with the Bears. It's a tale that's been retold by Barbara Diamond Golden and illustrated by Andrew Plews. I just have to say that illustration of the eagle in this uh, on the cover is just a uh, dedication page. It's just beautiful. Now... It was a time when we were still knew that animals could be people. Eagle people, salmon people, bear people. They could shed their feathers, scales, and skin as they wished. And at home, in their own villages, far from our watchful eyes, the animals we hunted, feared, and admired looked just like we do. We knew some of the proper songs and dances and ceremonies that we now know, but we were still learning the ways of living with the animal people. We learned some of these ways through a very unlikely teacher, a haughty and spoiled young girl of the Raven clan. It was summer. Then, as now, wild berries grew thickly all over the mountainside, and even those of noble birth had many tasks to do. The haughty young girl, who was a chief's daughter, moved among the berry bushes with two of her friends, picking and talking and laughing. And what was wrong with the last one? One friend teased the girl. He was so handsome. Not good enough for your parents, teased the other. They will never find a husband for you. They will, answered the girl. And he will be, but just then she tripped and fell into some muddy bear tracks on the trail. All the berries spilled out of her basket. Those bears, she complained loudly as she picked herself up. This isn't the first time I've soiled my clothes because of them. What a nuisance they are, always leaving tracks, droppings, eating the berries. Shh, whispered one of her friends in alarm. You mustn't talk about the bears, so it will anger them, said the other, looking about. We'd better go, said the first. Come on. And the girl's friends started behind the trail. They sang songs as they walked, so the bears would hear them and know how much they honored them. Those two, mumbled the girl, they would jump at the wind. Even though it was late in the day, she stopped to pick up more berries to replace the spoiled ones. She had almost filled her basket again when suddenly, snap! The strap broke and the basket fell to the ground. All her new berries tumbled out. The young woman groaned. Ugh. It was growing dark and she began to long for the comfort of her friend's talk. 
even for their loud singing. Leaving the berries behind, she returned to the trail. As she walked, she heard the soft rustle of snapping branches. Someone, something, was coming. In a moment, she could see two men. They walked quietly with confidence. The taller one was quite handsome. We've been sent to help you, he said. Let me carry your basket. Thank you, she said. She was relieved and thought that perhaps her parents had gotten word that she needed help. As they walked, the two men talked and joked. The girl enjoyed their company and did not notice how they headed up the mountain, not down. At last they came to a village. But this is not my village, the girl said. No, it is mine, the tall man said. Wait for me here while I talk with my uncle. He pointed to a spot outside <clears throat> excuse me, the great lodge in the very center of the village. The girl stood there, confused and growing angry. Handsome or not, she thought. He shouldn't keep a chief's daughter waiting. Finally, two men came out of the great lodge. Their short hair showed that they were slaves. Now I will be treated with some respect, the girl thought. Perhaps they will ask me if I am hungry or tired. But to her surprise and dismay, the slaves grabbed her arms and dragged her inside a small dark shed. They left her there and blocked the only doorway with a large boulder. The girl was stunned. There must be a mistake, she thought. She began to bang on the door. That will do you no good, said a high, squeaky voice. In the darkness, the girl could see no one. She began her banging again. Then she felt a pinch on her arm. It is Mouse Woman. Give me some wool and some fat. The girl stopped her banging. Mouse Woman? Will you help me for some wool and some fat? The girl reached for the mountain goat fat she carried to rub on her face and keep her skin smooth, and she took some wool from her earrings. This is all I have, she said. Mouse Woman snatched up the wool and the fat. One, two. Good, said Mouse Woman. Now listen to me. You have been taken by the bear people because of the way you insulted them on the trail. It was a chief with his magical powers, who made your basket strap break. And it was his nephew who led you here. I don't know if you see the teeny tiny mouse woman right there. But he didn't look like a bear," said the girl. "He does what he puts. Uh, he does when he puts on his bear skin," said Mouse Woman. "This is all a mistake," insisted the girl. "You're not listening," the Mouse Woman squeaked. "I will tell you what you must do. You must take the copper bracelet on your arm and break it into pieces." "Not my copper bracelet," she felt another pinch. Whenever you hear a slave push aside the boulder in front of this shed to bring you food, slip a piece of the bracelet under your tongue and keep it there. After you're eaten, say, I wish a give, to give a gift to your chief. Then cough up the copper. The bears will think you can turn food into copper, and copper is, a precious, is as precious to them as it is to your people. Perhaps, instead of making you a slave, the chief will let you chief will let you marry his nephew. Marry a bear? Oh no, I'm going home. If you wanted to go home, you shouldn't have thought of that so, you shouldn't you should have thought of that sooner, came the squeaky voice. 
on the trail before you showed such disrespect for the bears. Even one of noble birth shows respect. Mouse Woman's voice trailed off as she scurried away with the wool and the fat. The young woman sat down on the hard dirt floor. She took off her copper bracelet and fingered it lovingly and sadly. It had been a gift from her parents when she came of age. How far away her parents seem now. The next morning, the guards came again. They moved the boulder and told the girl to come outside for her food. She was glad to be in open air again, even for a few minutes. After she'd eaten, she held out the food bowl and said, I have a gift for your chief to show how much I honor him. In front of the amazed guards, she coughed up a bit piece of copper. Every time the guards came, the girl coughed up a piece of copper, coughed up copper and repeated her message for the bear chief. Finally, after several days, she was taken to his lodge. The great chief sat on a carved wooden seat against the wall. One bear skin after another hung on the walls of the lodge. You are obviously a person of high rank, the chief said. You can transfer transform slaves food into copper we have been looking for a bride such as you for my nephew the chief gestured to his slaves bring mats for this young woman and my nephew we will have a wedding feast the girl shuddered at his words she did not want to marry a man who could change into a bear but to be a slave would be worse the feast that followed was much like the ones in the girl's own village there was singing and dancing and gift-giving. There was an abundance of foods of all kinds, salmon and halibut, bird eggs, crab and clams and wild onions, and of course, berries. During the feast, the girl could feel the, feel the eyes of the bear people on her, watching her. She tried to hide her pain. She ate and sang and smiled, too. And to herself, she thought, I will not be here forever. My parents will send help. And while I am here, at least I will still be treated as one of noble rank. These thoughts helped her sit up tall on her mat. They helped her to glance at the bear chief's nephew. He was handsome, and his eyes seemed to say, I'm sorry, and you will be happy here. From the day of the wedding, the girl joined the life of the bear people. She knew she must. They watched her always. Were they still angry at her for in insulting them or just distrustful because she was not of their people? She did the work they expected of her. She helped hang the salmon strips on the drying frames and collected berries. She beat spruce root into strips for the hats and capes she would weave. But all the while, she looked for signs of rescue in the woods and bushes and streams. She could not help but long for her lost family. She would see her mother's face looking at her from among the drying racks and her youngest brother standing by a tree practicing with his spear. She thought she heard her friend's laughter spilling over into the berry bushes. The young woman's bear husband was kind to her. His eyes had not lied. 
Knowing how much she hated seeing him in his bear form, he always assumed his bear shape at a distance. But one day, when she was longing for her family and her home, he gave her a present, a thick brown bear skin of her own. At first, she could not bring herself to touch the skin, let alone put it over her. But she knew this was what her husband wanted her to do. And one afternoon, after he'd gone hunting, she lifted the skin from its box and touched it. It was just soft. It was soft and warm and shone in the light. When she covered herself with it, she felt comforted. An affection for her husband and the bear people enveloped her, and she forgot her other life for a time. After the cold months near, the sleeping months, the bear people moved to their winter village and the young woman knew she would have a child. Would this baby be a bear or a human, she wondered. When the time came for her to give birth, she had not just one baby, but two. Her twin boys had arms and legs and faces like her people, but they tumbled about, bumping into each other just like any other, any bear cubs. And like their father, they could put on bear skin and be bears when they wished. The young woman grew to love her playful sons, and she grew to love her handsome bear husband as well. But still, something deep within her, within her was often far away, in that place she remembered as home. And at these times, she still secretly longed for a rescue. It was a time when the salmon spawned in the streams that the young woman noticed how quiet her handsome bear husband had become. When she looked at him, she saw a deep sadness in his eyes that she had not seen before. Something is troubling you, she said. I know things from my dreams, he told her. I see your youngest brother searching for you. The young woman looked up, startled. Her husband had never talked of her brothers or her parents or her home or of her being stolen away. We must move from here, he continued, to a cave above the cliff. The young woman did as her husband said and moved with him to the cave, all the while feeling a kind of excitement within her, her brother, how long it had been since she had seen him. All summer they lived safely in the cave, eating, playing, and sleeping. But when the first snows came, her bear husband once again grew distant, thoughtful, and sad. Your brother is very near, he told the young woman. He is going to find us. Please do not kill him, she begged. He is my brother. No, I will not kill my brother-in-law, said her husband. But I know from my dreams that he must kill me. As a young woman watched her husband put on his bear skin, she was filled with a great love for him. She was at last able to look at her, his bear self, but her love for him was mixed with sorrow. Please, let me talk to my brother. No, my wife, you must listen to me, her husband continued. His words reminded her of the mouse woman's words so many months before. It is important that my spirit be set free to return to my people and watch over you and our sons. Tell your brother that once he spears me, he must build a fire and decorate my head with feathers. He must sing the death song that I will sing and burn my bones in the fire to release my spirit self. Whenever one of your people kills a bear, he must do the same. You and your brothers teach them. In this way, my people, the bear people, will not be angry when one of your people kills a bear for their food. Will you do this? The young woman looked into the, her bear, bear, well, into her bear husband's eyes, so full of kindness and caring. 
I will do as you ask me, she answered. She held him to her and then took, some, took her sons into the cave to wait. Soon she could hear her husband sing his death song, and then she heard her brother's spear find its mark. She felt as if the spear had entered her own heart. It was a young woman sobbing that drew her brother into the cave, spear ready, not certain of what he would find. Don't, she called. It is your sister. Her brother dropped his weapon and came to her. She told him all that had happened to her, and together the brother and sister built a fire. They sang her husband's song and released his spear itself. The next morning, the young woman, her two sons, and her brother returned home. As promised, she taught her people her bare husband's songs and ceremony. She reminded them always to treat the bears and all animals with love and great respect, and the village prospered with good hunting and fishing. She knew her bare husband watched over them as he said he would, and neither she nor her sons ever forgot they were of both villages, their bare peoples and ours. And... Now this story ends. You see the bear spirit there? Now it's time for our second story, which is Snow White and Rose Red. It is a Grimm's Brothers tale that has been retold. And it was retold by... Um, Kelly George, and this book is illustrated by Kelly Ivanko. There once was a poor widow who lived in a little cottage by the woods. In her front garden grew two beautiful intertwining rose bushes, one with white flowers and the other with red. The widow's two daughters were just like the rose bushes, different, but equally lovely. You see the two daughters in the, in the, in the window right there? Snow White's hair was white like the stars, while Rose Red's hair was as dark as the space between them. Snow White was quiet and gentle, while Rose Red was loud and lively. Snow White preferred to sit indoors and read, while Rose Red liked to romp in the meadows and sing. Both girls were helpful, grateful, and loving. <clears throat> Excuse me loving and never thought badly of anyone or anything. When they went into the woods to pick berries, they fed rabbits clover from their hands, deer grazed beside them, and birds perched on their shoulders and sang songs. If they stayed too long and it got dark, they would lie down beside each other and sleep on the moss until morning. Trusting and loving her girls, the widow never worried about them. One morning, when they wo awoke after sleeping overnight in the woods, they saw before them a beautiful child in a white dress. The child stood silently and looked at them in a friendly way, then quickly disappeared into the forest. Looking around, they discovered they had been sleeping right next to a cliff and surely would have plunged over if they had walked any farther in the dark. When they told their mother about them, she said the child must have been the angel who protects good children. Yeah. 
One stormy winter night, they were startled by a loud thumping on the door. Rose Red, please open it, said their mother. It must be a traveler seeking shelter. Rose Red hurried to the door, expecting to see some poor soul. But when a black bear stuck his head inside, she screamed and backed away. Snow White ran and hid under her mother's bed, and Rose Red followed. The bear spoke, Please don't run. I won't hurt you. I am half frozen to death, and all I want to do is warm up. You poor creature, said the wind widow. Come here and lie down beside our fire, but not too close or your fur will be singed. Then she called to her daughters, Come out, dears. This bear is not going to hurt us. The girls crept out and stared at the giant beast. As the bear began to warm up, he asked them, Would you please brush the lumps of snow from my fur? With shaking hands, with shaking hands, the girls took out a whisk broom and removed the snow. Little by little, they lost their fear of the strain, their strange guest. Cozy and content, the bear began to snore, and the girls began to play with him. Rose Red, Red, Rose Red walked with her bare feet on his back and to tried to roll him over, while Snow White, Snow White rubbed behind his ears and felt his soft fur between her fingers. The bear woke up and was good-natured about their play. Later, the widow said to the bear, You're welcome to stay the night if you wish. And so he did. He left early the next morning, ambling through the snow into the woods. But the next night he returned, as he did every night thereafter. The bear enjoyed romping with Rose Red, but most of all he liked to fall asleep as Snow White gently combed his snow his fur. When spring came and the snow melting, the bear announced I am going to leave now and won't return until next w winter. Where are you going? asked Snow White. To search for my treasure that was stolen by an evil dwarf, he replied. In the winter, the dwarves stay under the frozen ground, but now that the ground has thawed, they will break through, looking for more treasure to steal. Whatever they take and carry off to their caves is hard to recover, he added. Don't worry, I will be back next winter. If you ever need help, just call and I will come. When Snow White gave him a big hug goodbye, she thought she saw gold glimmering under his fur, but was it, she wasn't completely sure. The next day, the widow sent her daughters out to fetch wood for the fire. Soon they came upon a big tree that had just been cut down. Beside it, a strange small creature was jumping up and down on the grass. They couldn't figure out what it was until they came nearer and saw it was an old dwarf with a wrinkly face and a very long white beard. The tip of his beard was stuck in a crack of the tree trunk. He stared at Snow White and Rose Red with angry red eyes and screamed, Why are you just standing there, you dumb dolts? Come here at once and help me. What happened? asked Rose Red. Can't you see? he shouted. I was splitting this big tree trunk to get some firewood. I drove my wedge in, but it popped right out of the wood and cracked closed and caught me. Now my beautiful beard is stuck and you two just stand there and laugh. Of course the girls were not laughing at all. They pulled as hard as they could on his beard. 
course the girls were not laughing at all. They pulled as hard as they could on his beard, but it was stuck fast. Don't you have any better ideas? cried the dwarf. Yes, said Snow White. She took out a small pair of scissors from her pocket and handed them to Rose Red, who snipped a bit of the dwarf's beard off. As soon as he was free, the dwarf yelled, You beastly brats! How could you cut off the tip of my beautiful beard? Then he grabbed a small sack hidden between the roots of the tree and ran off without a thank you or a goodbye. How strange, said Rose Red. But thinking no more of it, they continued with their task. A few days later, Snow White and Rose Red went to the brook to catch some fish for supper. As they approached, as they approached, they saw what looked like a huge frog jumping up and down towards the water as if it were about to plunge in. They ran to see what was going on and immediately recognized the dwarf. What are you doing? asked Rose Red. A few days later, Snow White and Rose Red went to the brook to catch some fish for supper. As they approached, they saw what looked like a huge frog jumping up and down towards the water as if it were was about to plunge in. They ran to see what was going on and immediately recognized the dwarf. What are you doing? asked Rose Red. Are you going swimming in the brook? How could you think that, you gullible goose? screamed the dwarf. Can't you see that a fish is about to pull me in? I was just sitting here fishing when the wind tangled my beard in my line. Come here at once and help me. Rose Red grabbed his arms to keep him on the shore while Snow White tried to untangle his beard from the line. It was hopeless. There was only one thing they could do. Again, Snow White took out her scissors and handed them to Rose Red, who snipped off a bit of the beard. As soon as he was free, the dwarf yelled, You terrible twits! How could you disfigure me like this? Wasn't it cruel enough to clip the end of my beard? Now you've cut off the best part! Then he grabbed a medium-sized sack hidden in the rushes beside the brook and ran off again without a thank you or a goodbye. Even stranger, said Snow White. But again, thinking no more of it, they continued with their task. A week passed, and the widow sent Snow White and Rose Red into town for some needles, thread, lace, and ribbon. On the way, the girls passed through a grassy meadow littered with blue rocks. Suddenly, a huge eagle swooped down behind a rock not too far from them. They heard a horrible cry and ran to help. To their horror, they saw that the eagle had seized the dwarf they had rescued twice before. The girls grabbed the dwarf's leg as the eagle struggled to fly away with him. Finally, the eagle gave up and let go. As soon as he was free, the dwarf fell, You clumsy claws! You pulled so hard that my thin jacket is now shredded and my pants are ripped. Then he picked up a big sack hidden behind a rock and ran off without a thank you or a goodbye. By now, Snow White and Rose Red were used to his ingratitude. They shrug shrugged their shoulders and merrily continued on their way to the village to do their shopping. Later, on their way home, while they were passing through the same meadow, they were surprised to see the dwarf again. He was even more surprised to see them, for he had just emptied his big sack of jewels and was inspecting them. The setting sun shone on the sparkling stones, making them glitter and glow. The girls stopped in their tracks, mesmerized. 
Why are you staring at my treasure? The dwarf screamed, his face turning scarlet with rage. You planning to steal it, you wicked wretches? I'll get you! He picked up a pointed stick and lunged towards them. Help! Help! they cried, jumping back. Their voices echoed through the woods where they, their friend the bear was roaming. He heard them and remembered his promise. All of a sudden, there was a loud growling, and a huge black bear darted out of the woods towards the dwarf. The dwarf cried out in terror. Not you, he stumbled backward. Here, take the treasure, take all of it back, but don't eat me. Eat those girls instead. They're as fat as young quail and will make a tasty feast. Go after them quickly, or they'll get away. Ignoring the dwarf's ranting, the bear charged him. With one powerful blow of his paw, he knocked the dwarf down dead. Snow White and Rose Red. Oh, sorry, didn't show you the page. Let me go back. Snow White and Rose Red didn't see this, for they were fleeing across the meadow as fast as they could. The bear called out, Snow White, Rose Red, don't be afraid. Stop, wait for me, and I will walk home with you. The girls recognized the voice at once. They stopped and turned to greet their friend. As he approached them, his furry hide fell away, and before them stood a handsome young man dressed in a golden cloak. Snow White and Rose Red were speechless. I am the son of a king, he exclaimed to, he explained to them, and that wicked dwarf stole my treasure last year. He turned me into a wild bear, and his death, death was the only way to break the spell. Don't feel sorry for him, for he earned his fate. Thank you for helping me. Thank you, you saved us from him, said Rose Red, but I hope in the world beyond he will find happiness. And peace chimed in Snow White, for the girls could, couldn't think badly or wish harm upon anyone, even the ungrateful dwarf. Perhaps he will, said the prince, but your happiness, I promise, shall only grow in measure. And it, so it was true. Snow White married the prince. Rose Red, who at first did not wish to marry, eventually fell in love with the prince's younger brother, who was gentle and sweet like her sister. The girls invited their mother to live with them in the joy and comfort of the castle. When she moved, the widow took cuttings from the two rose bushes that grew in front of their old cottage and planted them in front of her bedroom window. Every year thereafter, the bushes bore the most vivid red and white roses, different but equally lovely in every bloom. The end. Well, I hope you enjoyed those two tales, and now we're going to uh, be making our little bear. Now, in your kit that you got from the library, you should have got, gotten um, a little bear that's already cut out and punched with holes, uh, some stuffing, a needle, and some thread uh, to go with it. And also, I did uh, put in a cutout of a little bear in case you want to trace uh, some material, whether it's felt like this 
or uh, some other material to make uh, more bears. And I would recommend if you're going to trace it on material, use a piece of chalk because that way you can dust that off and it's not permanent like ink or pencil. And uh, I used a little uh, leather puncher uh, to make these holes. Now, first thing we're going to do is string our needle. So you're going to take your thread and make it all nice and straight. Make sure there are no uh, kinks or unravel, uh, and unravel any knots or what have you. So then you're going to take your needle. And you're going, it has the eye of the needle is quite big. And you're going to take your thread and you're going to push it through that needle and thread the eye of the needle. Now see how it's uh, got a little bit of thread there that's knotting up, just uh, pull that steady through and that'll be okay. So you pull that through and what we're gonna do, I'm going to double the thread so when it goes through the holes, so I'm gonna make sure it stays unraveled and the bit that we just pulled through the eye of the needle, we're going to pull it so the other end, they're, they're matching at the other side. So it would look like this. Now I'm going to put the needle down on the table and the ends where they're equal. We're going to make a knot at the end. Just a simple knot. So we're gonna go around one finger. Flip it around. If you need to ask your grown up for help, that's perfectly all right. And then through your little hole, your loop there, and tighten. Just a little knot so it stays together. Now, when you pulled your teddy bear out of its bag, you'll see these bits that have the hole that show where it was punched and you'll see the little chalk mark. What you're gonna do, so that's gonna be on the inside, we're just gonna flip it over. So if you see, now it's all the nice neat side right there. Now I do have one that is partly threaded already. And if you wanted to make a face, and you don't have to, because I think the bear is adorable, if you don't have a face, you can make a face if you have a marker. You can ask your grown up for a Sharpie marker or something permanent like that. Uh, or if you have bits of material, you can glue them and make a face. But if you're going to do this uh, using glue or something like that, I recommend you do it before you stuff the bear. Because that way you can hold it down flat and make sure it's thoroughly dry. Once it's stuffed, it's a little more difficult to do that. Not impossible, but it takes it's a little more difficult. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to start sewing your bear closed. Now I like to start down by, whoop, there's a bit of material everywhere starting down by the foot. So you're gonna hold your bear and you can use uh, little clips. I've used binder clips to help hold the bear closed. Makes it a little easier when you're sewing. And if you find a hole by the foot, which you prefer to start at, I like starting down by the heel. So I'm going to stick my needle through that and thread it through until I'm quite at the end. And then if you see below the knot, you see that little loop there? I'm actually going to put my needle, see there's a knot that I made. I'm going to put my needle through that so that's where we're at the end where we start our starting point and it's going to stay you can take this uh, extra bit of string and make another knot with your um 
the needle that's still uh, going to continue on. So that way you have a nice uh, beginning point that's going to stay. Just a nice knot, just as if you were tying your shoes. Well, you don't tie your shoes in a knot, but you start with the same, so the over and under and through. Okay, gonna do the over and under and through twice. So I just did one, so over and under and through and then just pull it. There we go, perfect. Now I like to go around this way when I'm sewing because we're gonna sew almost to the end. You wanna leave a gap as big as your fingers can handle. And then you're going to use the stuffing you got to stuff your bear. So I'll leave you to, you can pause the video so you can uh, start sewing. So remember, you're gonna go through the hole, through both pieces of felt. Got to pull your needle through and it's okay. See how it got uh, wrapped up? You just got to unwrap it and keep going. Now you want to pull it so it's tight, but not super tight because you don't want to bunch it up. So you want it tight so it lies nice and flat. And so we went, just went down. So now we're going to go up through the next hole. See that right here? Got to go up through that one. So up, through, and pull it, but not tight, so it's nice and flat. And now we're going to go th down through the next hole. Again, do not hesitate to ask your corona and pull it through. There we go. And you're just gonna follow through. Now I'm gonna time we've all gone through that. As you can see with this bear, I've done quite a little over and through. So it's tight. See how the stitches lay nice and flat. It's not bunched up tight. All right. So I've got just enough bit, uh, open there to take some of uh, my stuffing. And I would take little bits of stuffing at once. That way it's easier to push up in through your bear. So I'm just going to open that up a little bit. And use my fingers to push up through to her head. There we go. You know. And take another little bit. And push up through. Now, if you do, do decide to make another bear with some material at home, and if you try and to use it, uh, want to use a real needle and thread, that's great, or just some felt. And uh, if your grown up has a, a little uh, material puncher or, or, or felt, that's great. And if you don't have um, cotton fluff, you can use any old bits of uh, material that your grown up might have lying around, whether old clean obviously clean rags and you can cut them up into teeny teeny tiny pieces like this and use that as stuffing i have learned that old nylon stockings actually cut into small pieces make perfect filling for pillows but that's just a So still see how um, this little girl bear, she is filling up nicely with her stuffing. Gonna push some into her hands, but not too much because you don't want to bust your seams. Don't want to put too much pressure at the seams. All right, there you go. And you see where you're just at your stitch line there. That's where we're gonna stop. You see the holes there? Because I don't want to go past the, the holes. All right, so I'm going to hold this closed and continue with my stitching. 
So I'm going to go through there and keep on stitching. Again, just keep on stitching. Again, I'm pulling it so it's tight and the stitches lay flat, but I'm not pulling them so the stitches bunch up. Okay, I'm at my last hole now. So you see I still have some string there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, like we did in the beginning, I am going to loop through, actually that hole again, I'm going to loop through and leave a little bit open right there. And I'm going to pull my needle through that. Oh, my thread, my thread loop there, and pull it tight closed. There we go, pull that tight. And I'm going to make a little knot. So my over, and then go through with the needle. Uh, I don't think that video, part of the video was clear. So make a over of my finger. And through, you can just go through with your needle. And pull that tight. Now, I forgot to say that you are going to need a pair of scissors at this point. Now, what you can do is you can leave a little bit at the edge there. Cut that off so you have a little bit there, a little bit here, and you can tie them together if you like, or you can just snip it closed, whatever you're more comfortable with. I am going to snip mine closed because I'm okay with the needle there. And there you have it. This little girl bear is finished. I hope you uh, enjoyed that craft as well. Would this uh, episode of Storybook Adventures be sure to join me in February? Now, please, I hope you um, take some pictures of your bears because I would love, love, love to see your final bear product. So take some pictures and you can email them to children at huntlib.org. And that would be fa oh, fabulous to see them. All right. Take care. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.